In the name of God, a man, I learn Skilson of Great Castle Street in the city of Middlesex. Do make this my last will and testament, whereas I am possessed of £25,400, standing in my name in the Bank of England. I do hereby give and bequeath the same as a fund for the erection of a schoolhouse on the green of Old Castle in the county of Mead and Kingdom of Ireland, my native parish. As you come into Old Castle from Kells, on your right-hand side, you really can't help but notice a rather imposing building. This is the Gilson School, endowed by Lawrence Gilson of Old Castle, County Mead, in his will in 1809. It's a beautiful, elegant building, purpose-built as a free school for boys and girls of all religions. A radical idea for its time. Now, one of the things that interests me about the building is that my great-grandfather was stationed here in Old Castle in the RIC in the late 1800s. And so I've often wondered whether any of his sons actually attended school here in the Gilson School. So I thought I'd try and find out a little bit more about it and show what better place to start than the local library. Lorraine, how are you? Hi, Sue, how are you? Not too bad. Look, I've just been up at the Gilson School, you know, the school up the road there. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any information about what that building was or anything yeah, about it? Yeah, no problem. So um, I'll just have a quick look here on the system. I'm nearly sure we definitely have something here in stock and I'll have a quick look and let you know. So let's see, so yeah, if you want to come up here, I'll just show you now, should have something here, I think by Christopher McCormick. Yeah, quick look here on the shelf. Ah, oh, okay, the yeah. Gilson Endowed School, Old Castle County Meath. The story of a school search for identity. Well, if I don't get something in there, yes, exactly. I won't get it so, anywhere. Yeah. Brilliant. Do you think that'll that'll, that'll, that'll be brilliant. I'll I'll take it down here to your desk down there and I'll have a look. No and problem, if if so needs be, I'll take it out with me. No Is that okay? Problem. Thanks, yes. thanks, Lorraine. It, so no problem at all. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Well, it turned out that the author Christy McCormick lives just down the road in Kells, and he kindly agreed to meet me in the Gilson School to give me some insight into the state of education in Ireland in the early 1800s. Where we're sitting now is in what's known as the boys' school. That's what's written on the outside of the building. It's a huge, big cavern of a place, isn't it? It, it is, and it's a hugely interesting building because, I, I, to my knowledge, it's one of the few, if not the only, Lancastrian schools which are still in existence. What impresses people when they come into Old Castle is the facade of the building from the outside and and that building was designed by Robert Cockrell and uh, he was quite a celebrated architect in his own right. As we uh, look from the road the central portion of course is the schoolmaster's house Uh, to your left is the boys wing and to the right the girls wing but we have to bear in mind of course the population of the time The population of the time was something, certainly over seven million people. So that there were a lot of of boys to be educated. There was no national system. There was, of course, the hedge school system, very satisfactory in many, many ways. And it would have um, accommodated more than half a million students. So there were quite a good number of hedge schools in Old Castle when this one was built. And having already recommended to the clergymen of Old Castle that an equal number of their respective flocks should be admitted to the intended school. But it is my will that all children of the said parish, be natives thereof, shall be admitted thereto, of what sort soever they may be. So when this school opened in the 1820s, mm-hmm. I think, um, like, was there, what was the need then? If there were hedge schools, you know, as you say, what was the need for something like this? Yes, when other areas managed without them. The hedge schools were never, they were always frowned upon by the government. They were referred to as unofficial schools. And uh, they, they, they saw them, the school, the government saw them, you see, as centres of sedition and and as what they called 
profligate literature. And the reason they were frowned upon was that the government wanted control of the education of the children. And that was the rationale, of course, for the... Um, um, the, the national school system itself in 1831, the Stanley system. And it, it was a very tightly controlled system. Uh, I don't think there's anything since replicated it for the tightness of control. Uh, for, they had, for instance, what they call lesson books. They not only were in Ireland, they were in all the uh, colonial countries. There was an enormous demand for their lesson books. They all tended to be overloaded with factual material that was learned by rote, but very oftentimes poorly understood. So again, just thinking about the setting up of this school, and, and I, as my understanding is, it was set up as a, a, as a multi-denominational, mm-hmm. co-educational mm-hmm. and free school. Mm-hmm. So that sounds like a very radical idea. It is, of course, a very... In, indeed, it's very, very radical. Now, where he would have got the, that, that radicalised thought, it does give credence to the fact that he could have been educated himself in one of the uh, European uh, uh, Catholic uh, colleges. My wish is that the schoolmaster, pro temporar may have a house and garden. And I think one schoolmaster on Mr. Lancaster's plan of education will be fully adequate to the teaching of all the boys of the said parish. With the chill creeping into our bones, we continued our chat in a warmer spot in the main part of the building. I was interested to learn more about the particular system of education that Lawrence Gilson had prescribed in his will, the Lancastrian system. The Lancastrian system is the idea of mass production of products and the mass production of pupils. Lancaster talked about being uh, one teacher uh, being able to uh, control and educate something like a thousand pupils. Of course, he couldn't have done it without the employment of monitors and monitresses. They all s- sat in sections or drafts. There would be, of course, the master, but each section or draft would have a uh, tutor. And but it was so it was so regimented. <coughs> Here's the description here, I'll just read it. It's Moors. Kingsman Moors. The, the children are seated in the forms belonging to the first class. Opposite to them is their alphabet wheel or a board on which the letters of the alphabet are re- represented. The monitor of the class, now there would be six or seven monitors, six or seven classes in that division that all look up in the one direction, but they wouldn't be running around. Or The whole es- essence of it was regimentation. But there was also a philosophy behind I, I think Lancaster wasn't so much a system as a philosophy, because the thinking of the time was that you actually formed pupils. You broke pupils in the sense that you would train a horse. You know, break, batter, blow, and, and make them new. Make them into something else. The belief was a kind of, you know, or the power of original sin, a kind of Presbyterian, but a Catholic uh, tradition as well. And somehow they, they had to be disciplined and brought into control. And of course, that was even accentuated by the fact that there were so many of them. And of course, it depended on monitors, and monitors remained in the system at least until the 19th. 50s or 60s. And were those monitors like former pupils of the school? Is that where they... That's interesting. Yes, they were. And Gilson had a great, apparently, a great tradition in developing monitors. So that is part of its legacy to us. Both boys and girls' schools developed a reputation in training teachers. Now, this was very necessary, as I was saying, to the Catholic clergy. They, you see, ran a parallel system. They had nothing to do with the training system because they didn't want to send their Catholic children to Protestant schools. They've, there was the fear of proselytizing. So you can see that the national schools were, fe- were feeding upon the trained monitors and monitresses that were educated here in Gilson. It was the secular clergy that depended upon the head schools. The convents and the orders were able to educate their own. And as I wish to present all sorts of discussions, that the Protestant as well as the Roman Catholic may be equally eligible to be appointed master of the said school according to their respective merit. When a child rocked up to school here then, what might have been on the curriculum? Well, in the first 
uh, scheme up to 1822 to 50 years, they taught the basic primary um, program. But after 50 years, they developed a, really a veritable laboratory of secondary, technical, and um, um, vocational education. Because what remains of Lawrence Gilson's library is, is very little at the moment. Some of the books, you know, there's a lot of classical kind of texts again and geography and history and all that kind of thing would have been on the curriculum, I, I guess. We are talking now about the second phase, Scheme 2, 1858 to uh, 1891. And during that period, of course, the school was revolutionised. And it, it, it developed the specialisation uh, st structure. There was still the base of elementary, three R's. But there was a stream in it which developed into the secondary technical tradition. Now that happened, as was possible, for a number of reasons. First of all, it was well endowed. Yes, 27,000 uh, was uh, the, the residue of what was left. There was an, uh, a half yearly income of about 800 sterling. That was a lot of money. When you think that the masters in the uh, national system would be getting 40 or 50 and the mistresses maybe 20 to 30. A year? A year in wow. salary. So Gilson had that great advantage. It had funds. The £500 a year I have already given for the erection and foundation of the said school. In witness, I hear unto set hand this 30th of June in the year of our Lord, 1,809 years. What would you say, you know, in, in educational terms, was the, the legacy of Gilson in a place like Old Castle? Well, when you talk about a legacy of, uh, of any particular school, it can't be just geographically confined. It's national. And the legacy of Old Castle is national. The country is indebted to Old Castle. We have said at the start that Gilson, in his conception of the school and the disposition of his legacy, uh, uh, provided for co-education. He provided for the place for the clergy of all traditions and pupils of all traditions. We've basically only been discussing, if you like, the first scheme up to 1856. But it was after that that the school developed to become a secondary and a technical and an agricultural school. Why did it do it? As I said, the endowment was large. It could afford to employ good teachers, and it did. From 1859, the school had moved from being the elementary school to the next higher grade. In fact, Gilson School sent students up to the university. They got matric. Now, I say, in addition to the agricultural school, there was an intermediate. They had classics teachers. They did. They did the intermediate exam, one of the first schools in Ireland to do the intermediate, in 1879. They were the earliest school in Ireland to participate in what was called the Science and Art Department examinations. That was run directly from London. Listening to Christy McCormack, my curiosity was well and truly roused. I needed to find out more about the man behind this legacy, Lawrence Gilson himself. My search led me to a small graveyard in County Meath and Joe Mooney, who has tried to map out Gilson's family tree. This is Clonabraney. Lawrence's father is buried here. He died in uh, 1758. Well, Lawrence was born about 1740, and he had two sisters, uh, Jane and uh, Mary, and he had one brother, Nicholas. And they all attended school in Old Castle. So he did get some education. He did get some education, yeah. what, what was the occupation of his, his father, do you know? His father was a tailor. So he had some bit of an education, yeah. and his dad was a tailor. Yeah. So he obviously didn't take to the tailoring. Uh, no, no, he wanted to continue with the education, and he was interested in uh, trying to uh, get the local children educated. And uh, there's a story that says that he, he went, to, uh, went to London at the age of uh, 17 or 18, and then uh, in another story, he was supposed to have gone when he was about 20. So can... It's all very vague, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a yeah. bit of a mystery, mystery man mystery all around. Mystery man all around, yeah, all around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 
but um, he went to London and um, he lived in London. Uh, he did work for a bank uh, called Main, Main and Graham, and uh, but that went uh, into bankruptcy in 1792. There's a story uh, that appeared in Rick Nami uh, about him coming home dressed as a pauper and he went to visit his uh, brother and his brother didn't want to know him and he went to visit relatives and uh, neighbours and all that and none of them wanted to have anything to do with him so he went back to where he was staying in Noel Castle and dressed as a gentleman and then came back to his brother and his neighbours and the, and the family and uh, they all greeted him with open arms and invited him for tea and, and the whole lot and um, he didn't ha wouldn't have any of it and he's supposed to have gone back to London and married um, a rich lady and uh, she left all her money and property to him and this is where he's supposed to have got his money. Mm. And do you believe that story? No, for the simple reason his brother died at the age of 16 or 17 so he couldn't have come home to meet his brother. I found no record of a marriage of Lawrence Gilson and in all the affidavits uh, which I found in Kew in London um, it stated that uh, he um, he never married and he died without issue but it's a good story but it's a good story it's a good okay, story. okay. Yeah, yeah, it's a good story yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah so you have done a fair bit of work so we'll move yeah. on then we, we think he, he went to England and at some point he came back yes um, and at some other point he died made a will and, and left a load of money to build this school. The school, build the school okay. yeah. So you've done a fair bit of work. I believe that the will was contested. The will was contested. Um, his uh, two sisters had married. Mary had married uh, Thomas Gill, but she died before Lawrence. And uh, Jane married a James Rafferty. And Jane actually died just before he, uh, Lawrence died as well. But she had uh, named her husband as her executor and he contested the will, along with his niece, Mary Gill. And um, they were the only two that received anything from the will. You know? And, I mean, was it worth <coughs> arguing about? Was there, was there a fair bit of money involved? Uh, there was, what, 25,000 and 400, that's a, that's, 500 uh, pounds? That's a lot of money. And that was a lot of money back then. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, yeah, this, yeah. You're lo he died in 1810. There was, uh, that was a lot of money then. Yeah. yeah. You'd have to wonder, like, where somebody who you know, as far as we can tell, received a minimal education, went off to England. Where did he amass that money from? From, yeah, yeah. It's very yeah, strange. Yeah. And has anyone got any theories <coughs> or any clues or any, apart from marrying the, marrying the rich woman? Woman. No, there doesn't seem to be any information about it at all, you know, uh, uh, um, where he got his money from. Now, apart from working in the bank, whether that had something to do with it or not, I don't know. It's just, it's just, it's an, it's another le level of kind of mystery about right. him, you yeah. know, for yeah. somebody who, as I say, had such a significant impact, if you like, on Old Castle oh. and beyond, because so many people have gone to that school, mm. yeah. that very, so little is known about him. him. But it's lovely to come here to this beautiful graveyard yeah. and then see, there's, at least there's some little connection here. here. To this day, the Gilson Trust manages Lawrence Gilson's endowment. Richard Kilroy is one of the current members and I asked him what it meant to be a trustee. Well, it means that we, the Board of Governors, uh, are responsible for, the, for Lawrence Gilson's endowment, which he left and is managed by the Charity Commissioners. So the, the endowment and the property of the Trust are the business of the trustees, the Board of Governors. Uh, the, the two leading people are the, the Roman Catholic P Parish Priest of Oldcastle and the Church of Ireland Rector of Oldcastle, which now is Castle Pollard, Oldcastle and Mount Nugent. As well as that, each of the bishops nominated two members of the board, and I am one of the two Church of Ireland nominees on the board. Originally, the Board of Governors managed the school. They employed the staff and they controlled the finances. But obviously, since the new national school has been built, the board of management do that, take over that responsibility. So the, the, the trust members really are responsible for the endowments and the property. The, the, the trust was set up 
um, by Act of Parliament under the Educational Endowments Ireland Act of 1885. It was scheme number 56 in the County of Meath and that controlled how Lawrence Gilson's will should be administered. Under the original um, scheme, the governors nominated by the Protestant Bishop of Meath were James Lennox Napper Esquire of Lock Crew Old Castle and Matthew Weld O'Connor Esquire of Baltrasna Old Castle. And the governors nominated by the Roman Catholic Bishop of Meath were Lieutenant Colonel R. Donaldson of Clonmelon and the Right Honourable the Earl of Fingal, Killeen Castle Dunsany. And of course they were, as they died or were replaced, each of the bishops replaced those original trustees as and when it became necessary. The governors were constituted into a body corporate by the name of the governors of the Gilson School's Old Castle, with perpetual succession and a common seal, and power to acquire and hold property, real and personal, for the purposes of the scheme. It was a large endowment, and um, it is quite right and proper that it should be properly managed for the purposes of the school in Oldcastle. So the, 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 the school is well endowed, and I'd say it's, it's quite an exceptional scheme because it's, it's far-sighted. Lawrence Gilson was far-sighted, ecumenical, and all children in the area have a right to be educated. Like, just off the top of your head even, have you any idea why somebody like Lawrence Gilson made such an endowment for such a purpose? The reasons for that, I think, are passed on down by word of mouth, that he he had this experience um, coming back to his hometown uh, where he felt that the, the future for the people of Oldcastle was education. And he'd been to London... He'd met lots of people in England, and he obviously felt that not having children of his own, he had acquired considerable wealth. He felt obliged to leave it for education in Oldcastle, and we are, to this day, privileged to have had that. I just feel it's an honour that I was asked to be a trustee, and I hope that long after my day, the school will flourish as it is now. Uh, the, I think the most important thing in my time is that we now have commemorated Lawrence Gilson by putting up a beautiful statue to him, handing a book of learning to two small children. And that, in pride of place in front of the schools, I think is a, a, a great addition to it. It's an outstanding building in the county um, of its age, and it must be preserved. Maliki, how are you? (laughs) Well, I was back again in the Gilson School, this time to meet Maliki Hand, chairperson of a local history society, who had promised to let me have a look through some of the old school roll books to see what light they could shed on life at school in the early days, and also whether there might be any sign of my own ancestors there. So, listen, thanks very much for for meeting me. This is the, the archive room? Yeah, it's the archive room of the old Gilson School, and... We're looking in front of us with roll books. That's the main archive that's here. There's some small library in the corner here of some of the old books that were here from the old school. But we're just, I was just looking through some of the roll books and there's a mountain of information. They look uh, pretty ancient. Well, I think as far as we can see, they go back to 1883. We'll just have to be looking at 1898. Oh, I see. So they've got Most the here are Roman Catholic. There are some English church... So what does this, it gives you what, the pupil's age? It must be the starting age here and this, some started at six and a quarter, they're very precise, six and three quarters, they're seven, seven and a quarter, generally four and a half is the, four and a quarter is the earliest we see, there's yeah. one, four, and rate of payment, oh, or free, they the, the appear to be all free, free. and their name, Griffin, Hackett's, Murray's, Kelly's to be all names we might have heard of it. Foresight would be a bit unusual. Oh, and this one then has people's um, occupation of the parents. Oh, I see. We have a couple of labourers, farmers, doctor, harness maker, burns, farmer, farmer, 
Painter. Police constable. Oh, wow. Uh, it's not Mary a, a Reams, Barry. by the way. No, no Mary it's Barry. Barry. Oh, Mary right. Barry. Because one of the things I thought I might find would be my own great grandfather was here in sometime in the mid 1800s, 1880. Five, six, seven, that kind of date. But I'm not sure whether his kids would have been enrolled in school, but there's... You probably you might find if you keep looking long enough. For the yeah. Sun, yeah. They came from far and wide because, like, Newcastle, Millbrook, Glenboy, you know, tells you where people lived as well. Yeah, that's right, yeah. They wouldn't have been Millbrook. coming on the school bus in those days. No school bus. <laughs> I suppose yeah. if they were lucky, they might be yeah. left in a horse and like it's a fair walk, track. say there's cross somebody living in Cross Drum. Cross Drum. That's a good old walk yeah. for a child yeah. of. And the, the occupation there was a coachman. Yeah. Or maybe Daddy give him a or lift my, in the back of the coach. Yeah. I see you've got a few other ones open over here. What what was interesting yeah. about these well, these ones? This one, I think we're looking at uh, the reason why they left school. It says uh, cause of withdrawal and destination of pupil. Gone to Dublin. Now, obviously, the parents must have went because this child is only nine. Left, left off, off school. school. Well, I suppose they just had enough uh, um, implied at home. That child was 14. T- I'm sure that is quite common. And there's one here as well we were looking at. Uh, went to service. What yeah. would that be, in a, in a big house or something? And we're looking at an age of 10, I think. God, it's different. And it's a different we world. We make out the, 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 the occupation of the parents. Uh, what are we looking at here? Well, you see here, look, it says results of examination. So it tells you what what the curriculum would have been. So you've got reading, spelling, spelling writing, writing, arithmetic, grammar, geography. Needlework is crossed out here and you've got agriculture, drawing, music, bookkeeping. Oh, yeah. um, German. Greek, German and Greek. Greek. Algebra, Latin, something Latin. in French. Wow. They're all wrought in, but there's any... So not there's not many, many doing this, but it's um, amazing. It's an amazing curriculum for... It? for what, it was oh, where are we? What year is this? 1883. It's kind of a classical education. Absolutely. At the time. Can I browse here for a little while myself and have a look and see if my own... Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I hope you do I, find uh, some of your ancestors. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, the best thanks, to look. thanks. Mm. Despite my best efforts, I could find no trace of my granduncles attending the Gilson School. They may have been one of those wanted at home or not enrolled there for some other reason. However, there are still many people around Oldcastle who were former pupils of the Gilson Endowed School. One of them is Chrissy Gogarty, who did her leaving certificate there in 1949. Well, it was a most unusual thing to have a secondary school in a small town like this. There would be no other school like it in the area now. It it had a fantastic name. Where we're sitting now in your lovely sunroom, the wall out there is actually the schoolyard wall. It is, yeah. Mm-hmm. And were you there in the in the primary school? Or? I was. Yeah. Wow, what was the primary school like? I it was fantastic. <laughs> At least we thought it was fantastic. Did you have a school uniform? We had when we went into the secondary school. It was a gym slip. My mother, the Lord be good to her, used to make them for everyone. Uh, there was three pleats down the front of, you know, and uh, navy blue. And when you went into the into the secondary school, you yeah, had to have that uniform. The primary school, you wore your ordinary school clothes, you know. Yeah. And just in, in terms of the, the primary school, was it very strict, like? Oh, yeah. It's strict in that you did what you were told. And there was plenty of, of that. Plain flight, a big ruler, flat, flat ruler, and we were terrified of that. And were you living here in this house at that time? I was born here. Oh, you were born in this house? I was house. born here. Goodness me. Yeah, I was born So here. needless to say, you didn't hop over the wall, you walked. And you did not. I can tell you, I hopped over the wall. <laughs> the secondary school then was opened, which has been built into a fantastic school now too. That in upstairs in that school too, and that was the <coughs> fifth and sixth years. When you got that far, you went upstairs in that school. It was over the it was the cookery kitchen in the school. Like when you think of it, they had everything back then. 
Actually, it's lovely now. We can hear the kids. You can That's hear. It. Oh, you can hear them here. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> you obviously lived in the town, and it was the only secondary school. So I suppose, were it not for that school, some people have said they wouldn't have had a secondary education. No, not at all. They, they, they came from Castle Pollard, cool, and down New Inns. I remember people coming cycling, and this was all cycling to school from New Inns. Did you ever hear of New Inns? It's the far side of Virginia. It shows great de dedication to, you know, to I education. Do, I, absolutely. So did you enjoy your time in the school? You were there a oh, long time. Oh, sure, for heaven's sake. Sure, I was there until I was until I did the, the leaving cert. So your whole school life was spent... <laughs> well, absolutely, yeah. And yeah. we loved it, we loved it. And we were taught to be proud of it, you know, to respect it. Eddie O'Reilly is another former pupil who had a very particular connection and memories. So we're standing here just outside the school. Right. You would have stood here many a time. Well, we had a photograph taken there. That, that was the usual place on the left in front of the boys' school where the class photograph was taken. So it's one of them. I know we all had pioneer pins in one of them. <laughs> so so when, when were you in school here? 48, 49. I started in the in the infant school, which was at the back. So that building has obviously disappeared. What's left really is the three classrooms that were at the front. That they've been encompassed into one room. So now on the left, the football club, the Old Castle GFC, are using the left-hand side as a gym, which is really good. Yeah. And whereas on the right-hand side, it's basically been used, the girls is being used as a store. And so then you've got this middle bit. The middle part was set up really into three apartments, so the middle part became the residence of the principal of the secondary school. Well, look, will we go inside and you can tell me a okay, bit more yeah. about your about your school days? That'll be great. Cool. Yeah, yeah. It is a beautiful entrance to, to a building, isn't building, it? Yeah. And you told me also that you um, lived here. I did indeed. Uh, we got married in 1971 and we lived actually here for four years. Good heavens. So we lived well, in... Basically, what was the apartment belonging to the principal of the secondary school? The only thing is, we didn't use the main entrance because uh, we would have to share the boardroom, which was. So, is this the boardroom? Okay, will we, will we go in there and sit down? We get a bit of, bit of shelter. So, this is the boardroom, as in the board of the school? The board or? of the Gilson School, the trust, yeah. Oh, I see. So this is where they would have met. Met, yeah. So ah. there are steps underneath the boardroom here. Uh, underneath. Oh, that, I see that those steps. The yeah. I used oh, that's where you used to come in when you lived here for four years. Yeah. yeah. Was it strange living in a building where you used to go to school? I really enjoyed it. It was very nice. Three by five equals ten. Three by five equals fifteen. Four by five equals twenty. So tell me, let's sit down here and um, tell me about, um, you were here as a, in the, in the um, junior school. I was in the primary school, yeah, so I was in the secondary school from 58 to 63. Good memories in the primary school as well, so there were some characters. One of the things, even from a very early age, uh, mitching was a normal practice, especially if because we had the railway, which was very busy, so you had missed to see the trains. You could be lucky that um, one of the drivers, you know, would actually let you on the train, you know, when they were shunting. So, oh my goodness. So it was one of the things we could miss for. And I'm talking about from, from the infant school. And then when the circus arrived, that was another day for mitching. You weren't on your own mitching, there was plenty of mitching. Anyway, that was, oh, that sounds gassy. One of the teachers, Mrs Lynch, would be standing up, and in my case, anyway, get home at half twelve, hide behind the piano, thinking that I'm going to get away with it for mitching. And Mrs Lynch, who was teacher of the first class in infants, uh, would have sent up word where was Eddie or where was Kieran or whatever. But that was happening in other houses as well, so you weren't going to get away with it. But we still had a, a good morning. 
Three by six equals 18. But it, it was great. I, I mean, I've spoken to some other people about being in the school and they were saying that, like, only for it, only for this school and only for the legacy of Gilson, a lot of people wouldn't have had a secondary education in particular. Yeah. You go right back. You didn't have to be the secondary school. So in the earlier period, you know, there was no secondary school. People still ended up going to university. And you know, my own mother, we ended up getting a scholarship, a big scholarship from here. And so she went to UCD. That was in the early 20s. Wow. It was £200 she got, which was an awful lot of money then. You know, to, to go to a, UCD, yeah. Um, and Eddie, when you were here, or like, like, would you have been aware of how unusual this school was, say, in terms of like boys and girls being educated together, that sort of thing? We never saw it as an issue at all. You know, it was just natural. Um, and what about in terms of the, the you know, the multi-denominational aspect of it? Again, was that apparent to you or was it normal or...? It was normal. I mean, everyone got on well in, in the community. In fact, you know, I mean, I remember one particular person coming to the bank from the north. They just couldn't believe that, you know, that this was a community living together, Catholic and Protestant, that there was no difference. This was an unusual school yeah. for its day, yeah. but even up to the last kid that left here, it was still a fairly unusual school. Yeah, well, yeah, we never saw, we never were privileged to be here, basically, that was it. Teresa Abbott also attended the Gilson School and is also very conscious of the benefits and legacy throughout the years. Well, I certainly wouldn't have had an education because there wasn't the money, the possibilities, mostly were boarding schools, and there was no way my parents had that kind of money. I had retained a passion for this school because it gave us great opportunities. It was very good, really, and, and the fact of a co-educational school, which I haven't met anyone else, even in my um, adult life. And where did you come from? Like, to, to, were you were you living in Oldcastle? No, no. I cycled from Munchiconnet. Pupils cycled from as far away as Muller, Mermud, Virginia, um, Ballinlaw, and then out the other way, Millbrook. You must have been wrecked by the time you arrived here. <laughs> you weren't allowed to be wrecked. Um, no, because it was just the way it was. Uh, all but the, the well off came to school here. We always had the wind against us, and if we're a bit late, of course, we, we lived that bit. And yes, you got wet, and there was just a little stove in the middle of the floor, and you held your gym slip out to it, and uh, you, you dried it that way. It was a lovely school, and we've heard so much about punishments in schools. No, it was a lovely school, a lovely atmosphere, I was very happy here. And did you, like, I know you were saying the ethos was that there was lots of different mm. religions, so how mm. did they handle religious education? Well, every so often anyway, we did an exam, which was called the bishop's exam. But both um, sides did the bishop's exam. And um, the only one really that ever got first was this boy, Niall Heaney. He was Church of Ireland. But there was just as much celebration as his success as if it was one of, of the okay. Catholic children. So there was no real differentiation? As, there, was, there was none, absolutely none. We all interacted, we were just pupils together. We interacted, when I look back on it very well, boys and girls, and didn't matter about the religion, but it, it was a wonderful idea. And would you have been aware at the time of the, the legacy of Gilson? Did that mean anything? We knew about it, but no, it's only in later years since I came back here that I've really heard the full story and it has made me very passionate about wanting to preserve this building. I just feel it should be preserved at all costs mm. because it is a monument to Gibson. Maybe he was somebody like Bill Yates or some of those that uh, are almost reclusive but uh, made lots of money. Yeah. You see, he had been a teacher here and he must have seen the poverty and the deprivation and also bright children, you know, and unless the facilities are there. And he saw that people were growing up here and 
going to England to work may be illiterate. I just think he had a passion. He was somebody that made this money and maybe he wanted a legacy for himself and his hometown. Almost 200 years later, the sound of children can still be heard around the schoolhouse on the green of Old Castle, as Lawrence Gilson described it. Mark Carey is current principal of the Gilson National School, built on the grounds of the old school. But in educational terms, it's another world. The teacher really now is a facilitator uh, in learning. Huge difference from way back in the 1830s. It's, yeah. it's another yeah. world really, isn't it? It's absolutely, another world. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And given that this is the Gilson School, like, is there still that, that legacy there from, from the Gilson days, do you think, in the school? So in 2019, uh, we'd like to think that in the school that we've continued that legacy here. No child has ever been refused enrolment in this school on the grounds of religion or social class, and, uh, and rightly so. And um, the Gilson Trust does support the school financially, which is, is great. So from a financial perspective, they link in very much with us, the, the trust, we have, of course, the old school building, which is a, a marvellous architectural building. We've also two schoolhouses, which have two houses known as the schoolhouses, which have been developed in recent years. And, of course, the uh, trust also owns the um, Gaelic football pitch, the soccer pitch and the uh, pitch and putt. And they're huge amenities that the town has. And it's fabulous to have that green area there at the back of the school. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very evident that that legacy is, is very much mm. all around us. So what, Mark, about the future? So in the last year, we've applied for leader funding. So hopefully we'll be successful at that. The plans are to replace the two roofs on either wing. Both of those buildings are in a very, very poor state of repair. The funding hopefully, hopefully will go as far as developing the boys' side into a heritage centre for the town. On the other side, then, in time, we perhaps something for the children that are not involved in sport. So we hope to develop an area there for children to come and play, whether it be board games or pool or snooker or different types of activities to get involved and have that from them. So the, the heritage, looking after the children on the other side, I think would all feed into really the, the, the whole Gilson idea. The middle part of the building, it's not in quite as bad condition as the, uh, the, the boys wing and the, the girls wing of the old school, but um, it needs to be brought into line with current health and safety standards. The Loud Mead Education Training Board currently run classes for adults there, which is, which is great, but to have that going on on a sustainable period of time we need to get the health and safety standards up to up to the present uh, regulatory standards today. So um, that's the vision. That's where, what we want to, to do. Um, we hope the whole idea would that that building and everything that we can do with it would enrich the community in Old Castle, giving something back. So bit by bit, we that's the vision, and uh, we've great people working on the board of governors and indeed the board of management of the school who would feel the same. That's very important for us to develop those and give them back to the people of Old Castle and have those buildings working vibrantly, a heritage centre on one side, something for the youth on the other, and the adults' education in the middle. So there's catering for many aspects of the community in Old Castle, and the vision is that all that will be up and running in the next five to ten years. Uh, if we could do that, it would be really special, and it would. Um, we'd all feel happy that uh, we're continuing the legacy of Lawrence Gibson. Well, at the end of it all, I didn't find any personal connection to the Gilson School, and indeed the man himself and the source of his wealth still have that air of mystery about them. But there's no denying his good intentions and the value of his legacy to the people of Old Castle and beyond down to this very day. And if all the future plans for the building come to fruition, well, there's no doubt that the legacy of Lawrence Gilson will live on for many years yet.
This programme was researched, presented and produced by Sue Russell, with thanks to all the contributors and special thanks to the staff and pupils of the Gilson National School, Oldcastle. It was funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee.